Revelation chapter 7. So we left off at verse 14, verse 14. If you recall in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 14, these are the people who came from all sorts of different nations. They're the Gentiles. And you'll notice that their salvation is different from ours Amen. in that they wash their own robes in the blood of the Lamb, whereas we, the Christian church, we are washed by the blood of Christ. Christ does the washing for us. Amen. We don't wash ourselves. So here they are washing their own robes. Now let's talk about some of the things that we can observe concerning their, um, what they do throughout the tribulation or if they die and go to heaven. So you'll notice that verse 14, they said they came out of great tribulation. So meaning then, they've, uh, there's finally that post-tribulation rapture. Remember Revelation 6? They were all in paradise below the earth. And God told them, wait until the rest of the brethren receive their robes like them to go to heaven. So at this point, at verse 14, they <clears throat> receive their post-tribulation rapture. And at verse 15, they're up in heaven. So that's what happened. So remember, they were in this paradise below the earth, right? Waiting. receiving their robes, and then they went up to heaven. Now, we're going to look at some things concerning in heaven, which is kind of uh, interesting, and you'll see some distinctions and similarities with the Christian church when they go to heaven. <clears throat> Verse 15, Therefore are they, okay, those tribulation saints, when they go up, before the throne of God and serve him. Okay, remember Revelation 6? They were below the altar, right? That's the altar on earth at Jerusalem. Remember that at Revelation 6? All right. They were below, but now they're before the throne. <clears throat> that means they, they went up. What do they do before the throne? And serve him day and night in his temple. So now they're serving God up in heaven in his temple. So God has a temple up in heaven, that means. That's why what's going to be interesting is you're going to see similar things in the Old Testament mosaic pattern that God does up in heaven. Why is that? Because in the book of Hebrews, we didn't turn there, but I kind of mentioned it, the things that the Jews did on earth with Moses, the tabernacle, the sacrifices, and the laws is patterned after the things in heaven. So what's going on in heaven is this mosaic Jewish stuff. But the Christians, they don't have this because if you look at Revelation chapter 21, <clears throat> Revelation chapter 21. Notice verse 22. Revelation chapter 21, verse 22. Notice that this place, which is New Jerusalem, has no temple in it. Verse 22. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. See that? There is no temple in this New Jerusalem. Who is New Jerusalem? The Christian church. Look at verse 2. Verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. See that? So notice right here that New Jerusalem is the Christian church. New Jerusalem is a Christian church, and it has no temple. But wait a minute, this heaven has a temple up there. What does that mean? That means then, see, it's focusing, remember before, in the tribulation, in dispensations. I have to draw this out, otherwise people are not going to get it. Okay, so here we go. 
I usually draw four timelines, right, with uh, dispensationalism. So right here we have the Old Testament. Here we have the church age, and that's where we're at, obviously. And then right here you have the tribulation, and then here you have the 1,000-year millennium. That covers all the time periods in your Bible. Now remember, this one is referring to us Christians, the Christian church. Here, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. We established that last Bible study on Revelation. So uh, when we talk about New Jerusalem, the church, there is no such thing as Jew and Gentile. Amen. That's why Revelation 7 is not talking about Christians. We established that. Why? Because it mentioned one category of people, Jews, and then another category of people, Gentiles. But God doesn't see it that way. He sees us as one and the same people. So why did in Revelation 7 he separated it? Because the church is no longer there. Yep. See, God's switching to a different program. So the different program in the Old Testament, his program was with Israel. Over here is the same thing. He goes back to Israel. Right. That's why... Because these three time periods, the program is back to Israel, whereas here is toward the Christians. What's going on? What's going on is that we have no Jewish activity. Yeah. Here has a Jewish activity. Mm -hmm. Why? Because these are tribulation saints. In the tribulation, what is the program? Jewish. See that? There is some something that is particularly Jewish in this program that is different from the Christian because Christians are not tied to it. We have no temple. All right, let's go back to Revelation 7. So verse 15 shows they're doing a Jewish activity. So this is nothing, this has nothing to do with Christians. This is a Jewish thing dispensationally for tribulation saints not toward the Christian church. Do we get that? Yes, the reason why that distinction is very important is that's a key in dispensationalism, dividing the church from Israel. When you have that, all other doctrines are going to click easily. This is why this is utmost proof Christians cannot be the ones going through the tribulation. Amen. The program is focusing on a Jewish program here. <clears throat> Let's go back. And he that sitteth on the throne, so that's God or Jesus Christ, shall dwell among them. That's right. So God's going to be with the tribulation saints. They shall hunger no more. Why does he say that? Because they were starving to death That's at right. the tribulation. So now they're no longer hungry. Neither thirst anymore. Correct. You can't even drink because you don't have the mark of the beast. So now they drink. Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. So uh, they're not going to get the heat from the sun, which is kind of interesting you probably don't know this, but they're going to flee to Sila Petra, the rock. And over there is like a deserted area, and you can get a lot of heat. So it might have some reference to that. Verse 17, for the lamb which is in the midst of the throne. So there's your answer. Jesus is sitting in the middle of the throne. Shall feed them. Why does it read it that way? Because they were starving to death at the tribulation. They had no food. They were the ones being eaten up by the Antichrist, actually. But now Jesus is feeding them. And shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. So up in heaven, there are fountains of waters. Then. So that's something. It's going to be such a spectacular sight when we go to heaven one day. No. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Why? Because they cried. They wept during that time. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 24 to the tribulation saints, one to them that be with child and them that give suck in those days. Why? There's a lot of weeping. Yeah. There's a lot of weeping because the Antichrist is persecuting them. Now, this is important to understand. This verse says God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, meaning God wipes away the tears. People think that when they die and go to heaven, they're never going to shed tears in heaven. That's not true. You might say, well, doesn't it say they're, not, they're, they're no longer shedding tears? No, here's the thing. It says God shall wipe away all tears. What does that mean? That means they shed tears. They were shedding tears up in heaven, but God had to wipe it away for, for them. 
You might say, then you're saying there are tears in heaven? Absolutely. You might say, how so? How so? You want to listen to this part, okay? Trust me. Okay, here's a tribulation saint, but here's a Christian before the tribulation. That's, that's right. That's what I said. Before. So I have to put a dividing line here on it, okay? All right. Notice that when we go up, we have to go through the judgment seat of Christ. In the judgment seat of Christ, I did a study on that one. If some of you don't know, I would highly encourage you to watch the video on that one, on the judgment seat of Christ. So in the judgment seat of Christ, what God does is that he'll give you five different crowns up in heaven. And then as he gives you these five different crowns, he is also going to give you gold, silver, precious stones. But he's also going to judge you for all the works that you did in your life. As he judges you for all the uh, things that you did in your life, you're telling me you're not going to have shame, you're not going to shed tears. There's going to be a lot of tears over the things that you regret that you didn't serve Jesus Christ on. So that's why there's going to be tears shed. Let me give you another one. This is, uh, here's the judgment seat of Christ. So judgment seat of Christ. Right here, we've got the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment is where God is judging these people through the book of life and then casting them into hell fire because their names are not written in the book of life. You're telling me when you see your loved one and family member who you tried to give the gospel or you failed to give the gospel that you're not going to weep when they are cast into the lake of fire? You're telling me that? No, you're going to be weeping. See? So that's the reason why over here at the great white throne judgment, there's going to be definitely weeping. That's why it makes sense. The great white throne is mentioned at Revelation 20. And Revelation 21, God says God wipes away their tears. Why? Because at Revelation 20, they were shedding tears, seeing their loved one damned into hell. And then chapter 21, God wiped the tear so that they don't cry again. All right, so that's important to understand. So people who talk about there's no tears in heaven, that's doctrinally false, actually. There are tears shed in heaven. All right, let's go to Revelation chapter 8. <clears throat> And when he had opened the seventh seal, so there are seven seals up in heaven. Remember the sixth seal? We went through the sixth seal at chapter six, right? Chapter six, so this is important to remember. If you recall your seven seals, I don't know why black is not really working today. I might need, okay, that's better. The sixth seal right here is the finale. That's when the rich people and everyone is crying for the rocks to fall on them. Why? Because hide from the face of him that's coming down. Second advent. So we see already this is the end right here, right? This is not first century, correct? Yeah, this is not first century. Only a dimwit with beard and drinking beer with a beard would be the one that come up with this ridiculous interpretation Amen. and calls themselves the Pilagia Studios. Oh. So these ca Calvinist intellectuals are just full of doctrinal errors because they're just filled with intellectual humanism and pride. That's right, right. See, with all that intellectual humanism and pride, they blind themselves from the plain reading of Scripture. Amen. And I completely demolished that last time. Amen. So uh, I'm not going to get back into that. But the point is right here is that we see that this is the end. And any person with half a brain would see that too. So I'm sure we all can agree with that. Yes? Yes. Okay, then. All right. If we know that this is the end, all right, then look at this thing about the seventh seal, which is interesting. The seventh seal is not after the sixth seal, chronologically speaking. It's going to be an overview Okay, so let me explain right here. Chapter 8, verse 1. And when he had opened the seventh seal, okay, so remember, one, two, three, four, five, six. When he opens up number seven, it's going to be more of like an account summary, you're going to notice. You might say, isn't it in chronological order? No. 
In Revelation, if, it's impossible to do that. When you, if you're going to honestly read from chapter 1 all the way to 22, totally impossible. Amen. You might say, well, I don't believe that interpretation. Well, you'd better because uh, this is talking about prophecy. When you're talking about prophecy, you better use hermeneutics like really carefully. You got to look at the mind of God, how he sorts things out in his timeline. You might say, why do you think that this is possible? It's definitely possible if you read the first two chapters of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1 is a full account summary of the creation. Chapter 2, he gives specific detail. Chapter 1, he said he created Adam and Eve, but all of a sudden, chapter 2, he talks about Eve was created. See, that's not chronological order. See, chapter 1 gave a full overview here. So it's natural in God's perspectives that he will have certain chapters well, it'll be in chronological order and other parts as a full account summary. That is very important to understand. If you don't believe in that interpretation, then to be very honest, you don't know Bible. Okay, if you're an honest Bible reader, you would agree with that. There are certain chapters that give a full account summary outside of chronological order. All right, but let's see if this is true with chapter 8, okay? So when he opened the seventh seal... Here's the joke that some people say that there are no women in heaven, you know. There was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. I know, bad joke, all right. Don't, don't kill me, women. Please don't kill me, all right. I'm just, I'm just hearing from other rumors. If you would like to know the name of the preacher, okay, I don't know who they are, all right. You can stone that preacher, not me. All right. So, <laughs> I did not say that, onliners, okay. I did not say that. He's a new member of our church, by the way. Please forgive him. All right. So, okay, now, Dr. Upman mentioned that uh, he wasn't sure about why there would be silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Some conjecture is that because this is after the sixth seal, this is referring to Armageddon, where the saints are coming down, which is why there is silence in heaven for about 30 minutes. But to be honest, I agree with Dr. Upman. That's pretty loose interpretation it's too much because if you read from verses 2 through 13 and then chapter 9 and chapter 10 uh, there's a five month long period actually within these trumpets sounding out of the seventh seal so unless we're going like very very slow mo you know when we coming down in armageddon it doesn't make sense there's definitely no doubt it's an account summary